Hey, Math 43, I had a question coming out of chapter 12, number 80. And here we were given a bunch of data. And for number 80, it said use size as the independent variable, or what we would call the explanatory, the x variable, and cost as the dependent, or y variable, and draw a scatter plot. So I went ahead and I put my data in my list. It's L1 and L2 for independent, dependent, x or y, or really, again, I'll, I'll say explanatory. And response and I'm going to make that scatter plot and if we go into my stat plots you can see that um, right now all of them are off but plot one is pretty much ready to go it is a scatter plot I've got L1 against L2 so let me just go turn it on and hit zoom 9 and when I look at that thing it looks pretty linear actually right that looks to me like a strong linear relationship so does it appear from inspection that the relation that there is a relationship between the variables. Yeah, I mean, when I look at it, that, that looks linear. So the part C is saying calculate the least squares line, and let's go ahead and put it in A plus BX form. So let's go run linear regression, and I'm going to hit stat calc 8. Right? I'm going to breeze right on by stat calc 4. That's still linear regression, but that's where we have A being the slope value and B the y-intercept, and we, we do it the other way in stats. So I'm going to do L1, L2, and then I'm going to drop it in Y1. You can drop it in whatever variable you want. I'll go with Y1. And then I'm going to see this output, right? There is my slope. There, no, that's a lie. <laughs> a is my y-intercept. Uh, B is my slope. And you can see my R value is real high, right? That is pretty darn close to 1. So that's looking strong. So now part C says, hey, get the equation of the LSRL. So I'm, you can see it right here on um, my, my write-up, but there's my y-intercept, my slope. You see the little hat over cost, which is my response variable, my dependent variable, and size was the independent variable. And I probably should have mentioned when we were talking about the scatter plot that you can see my x's are labeled with size, right? And then I've got cost, my y variable, labeled on the y-axis. All right, so going back to the book work, it says find the correlation coefficient and we've got 0.999, and is it significant? That phrase, is it significant, is going to have a different meaning once we get to chapter 9. And we are doing these, these um, chapters out of order, so that question actually has a different meaning if you've gone through chapter 9. But all I want us to see is, like when it says, is it significant? Yeah, it's pretty close to 1, right? That, that's a real good indicator that this is a strong linear relationship. So. Part E says, hey, if the laundry detergent sold, were sold in 40 ounce size, what's the estimated cost? So they're giving me an X value, right? I'm going to predict a Y value. I'm going to predict a cost. And you can kind of see that E, uh, e and F have the same idea, right? One's predicting for 40 ounces. One is predicting for 90. And just taking a look at 40 and 90, those are both going to be examples of intervallation. And I say intervallation because if you look at my X values, they go from 16 to 200. And 40 and 90 are in that span. So I'm going to do these on my calculator. I'm going to do them both at the same time. Then I'm going to flip back to my work so you can see the algebra work that's going on. So if I want to do that, if I hit zoom 9, right, because I put that equation in Y1, you can see my linear model, the line, going through my scatter plot, which is the four dots. So now let's predict for 40. I'm going to interpolate. So I predict that the cost will be $5.00. And eight cents. If I want to predict for a 90 ounce size for this laundry detergent, oops, I hit nine. I meant to hit option one, excuse me, and then type in 90. And then apparently, if you buy 90 ounces of this detergent, we think it's going to be about six dollars and 93 cents. So if I flip back to my work, you can see that here. Oh gosh, that highlighted too much in parts E, right, and part F. And I'm putting in 40 ounces and 90 ounces respectively for E and F because that's what I was asked to do. Again, interpolation on both of these fronts. All right, so part G says, does the linear model appear to fit the data? Why or why not? Now, when I ask you a question like that, like, is this linear model good? There are three things you want to address. Was, what did the original scatter plot look like? What was your R value? And what was your, what your residual plot? Now, we said when we made that first scatter plot, right, and I can go back to it here, that was pretty linear, right? So thumbs up there or happy face there. And my R value, right, this thing, it was super close to one, right? Also, really good indicator of a strong model. The last thing we want to check is that residual plot, and that is the most important one. 
right? So if I want to go make a residual plot, what I want to do is I want to swap out L2 with my residuals. And as long as you've run regression, meaning you have something in Y1, this will work. If there's nothing in Y1, you're not going to get any answer. So I do have something in my Y1. I'm going to change my list over to residuals, and that's in second stat. And in this calculator, I believe it was in option eight. There it is. It's somewhere in your calculator. Um, I know for my home calculator, it's in seven. For this, this computer one, it's in eight. So go ahead and do that and then hit zoom nine and let's see what our residual plot looks like. Well, I can't see any pattern in there. That's looking pretty good. And you can see my little graph of my residuals, right? I still have my X variables on the X axis. But now, instead of cost here on the Y axis, I have residuals because this is a residual plot. No pattern in the residual plot. And all of those things, again, the scatter plot being linear, R being strong, no pattern in the residual plot. That means I've got a good fitting linear model. So I'm going to keep it. All right. So let's see what do we have. Are there any outliers in the data? All right. Outliers pop up when you have a residual that is more than two times your average residual length. And just taking a look at this residual plot right here, this is the only one I would be suspicious of. This to me looks like my largest residual. Like it looks like it's the farthest away from the x-axis. This one's also a little big. These are really small residuals out here. But let's go see how large they are. So I'm going to go to my lists and I'm going to go up into L3 and make L3 into my residuals. I'm, my calculator has that function. So let me hit second stat again and go get the residuals. So you see here I'm going to define L3 to be my residuals. And when I hit enter, my calculator is going to auto-populate that. All right, so let's take a look. Um, my largest residual, I mean, they're not actually they're a little large. So you have negative 0.2 here and 0.2 here. So those two are almost the same length. It's just one is negative and one is positive. And if you remember, I did, I had one below the x-axis, one above the x-axis. But let's just head back here. So just keep in mind, we have this about 0 0.20, 0 0.201, or 0.21. That's about the largest my residuals are going to get. So what we need to check is what was the average residual length, double that number, and see if any of these beat it. All right, so how do you find the average residual length? Well, there's a calculator function for that, and it goes into a newer part of your calculator. So we actually go to stat um, tests, and when we get to chapters eight and nine, we'll start using these. We're not there yet, so what you need to do is go to the one that says linear regression t-test, and it's so far at the bottom, it's actually faster to scroll up, and depending on which calculator you have, it might be option F, might be option E, D, it just depends. So go find the one that says linear regression t-test. We all have it. All right, so let's hit enter. You don't have to do anything here except go down to calculate. All right, so I'm going to hit calculate, and some of these numbers will seem familiar. All right, there's the y-intercept, there's the slope, but the one I really want is this s value. So you see it there. It is actually telling us the average residual length is about 0.205. All right, now let's double that number. All right, so if I take 0.205 and I double it, what am I looking at here? I'm looking at about 0.41. So what I want to do is I want to go back to that residual list and see if there was any number that was larger than 0.41. And you can see there isn't. Right? This isn't larger than 0.41. This isn't larger than 0.41. And let me scroll down here just so you can see my work. Right There are all of our residuals. There's my average residual length. I'm going to double it to the point where our, our safety zone is for, uh, about point, or 41 cents to negative 41 cents because you go two up and two back from zero. Um, and so since there's no residual that's larger than that, I don't have any outliers, which is fine. We just needed to determine if there are outliers present. All right, part F is the LSRL value for predicting at 300 ounces um, valid. Okay, now 300 ounces, it, like it's a little red flag because you're like, whoa, dude, we only go to 200. All right, let's see what happens when we extrapolate that far. Now, I can plug 300 into my linear model, and you can see this $14.72 coming out. I just want to show it to you on the calculator because usually something wonky a little happen will happen. So if I, oops, and also just taking a look at it, I don't want to do it here. That's on my residual plot. Let me go back to my original. Let me get my scatter plot up here. All right, now let's hit zoom nine, and this should be working. Okay, now if I try to predict for 300, 
my calculator is going to give me an error, and I just want you to see this, right? It's going to say, hey, invalid, and the reason for that is it's freaking out over the number 300, because if you look at my window, my x values are only going to 218, and that's because when you hit zoom 9, your calculator looks at your data in L1 and L2, oops, let me go back, I meant to go to here, and so in it, for L1, for the x's, it's going around 16. 200, right? That's that's what it's doing. It's going a little bit lower than 16 and a little bit higher than 200. So 300 is way outside that range. I'm just going to adjust this. I'll make this 350. All right, and I'm not going to hit zoom 9. I'm just going to hit graph. All right, and then let me hit second trace option 1 again. Now let me plug in 300 and it'll work because I have the right window. And you can see right there it's $14.72. All right, so that matches the, the little... Uh, arithmetic work I got. Now this is probably not a reliable estimate, right? This is massive extrapolation and so it, it really could be off. It's, it's hard to tell unless you actually found a detergent that was um, 300 ounces. Oops, let me go back here. If you actually found a detergent that was 300 ounces and could check it, that would be great. But right now I just, I'd be a little suspicious. All right, and then last question, it says what's the slope, or excuse me, what is the slope and interpret it. Well, here is our slope value. It's always the one connected to your independent variable. So it's 0 0.307, right? And so for every additional ounce in the size of this laundry detergent, the predicted average increase in its cost is about 0 0.037, or about four cents. All right, oh, that was a long one. All right, thanks so much, everyone. I'll see you later, bye.